the symbol that God is with us. Does anyone have presents that you still need to unwrap? Do you? Yeah, well, so do we. In fact, because Philip and Jen went to Arizona for Christmas, I can't believe this, because I do really. Debbie doesn't do things early. I mean, you know, you can't do it ahead of time. So you've got to do it after Christmas, right? Because see, since they were going to Arizona, we chatted about maybe trying to do something ahead of time, although for one thing, it's just way too busy. But secondly, you know, it's, there's tradition, and you can't open things before Christmas, right? Except for the pajamas on Christmas Eve. That's a Mellinger tradition, too. you got to get the pajamas. They, by the way, for Debbie, they have to be flannel, okay? And then, so it's, it's, just, it's just part of the tradition. So we still, we still have Christmas presents that we're going to open. Yeah, so see, we, we're kind of stringing it out like the 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, for years in ministry, I've just really felt like it's the couple weeks after Christmas that that's when that's when we get to worship Jesus. That's when we start putting our hearts and our focus completely on him. We kind of get away from just all the stuff and just enjoy who he is. But one of the things that, that we need to realize is that we need to keep opening up the presents all year long. All year. The fact that Emmanuel has come to be with us means that he's there when we're in the toughest and most darkest moments. We're not alone. When we're tempted to sin and we're, and we're really thinking about giving in to it, he's there with us. When we're discouraged and we're ready to give up and maybe even getting so depressed that, that just everything looks dark, he is Emmanuel, God with us. When the bills for December come in January and you see that number that you thought was lower, He's with us when you're facing a trial and the doctor says you need surgery or whatever else it might be. He's with us. I couldn't help but think about that uh, as we're going through this season, there are some people that are really hurting. Some of you may have heard the story of 12-year-old um, Ramon Martinez. He lived in Upland. He got uh, one of these uh, electric laser scooters. He had a helmet and everything. In fact, his sister says he got everything he wanted. It was his happiest Christmas. On Friday morning, he rode his scooter from the driveway out onto the street. And when he did that, a lady was coming down the street uh, and was unable to stop the car because he had come out there so fast and struck him. They rushed him to Loma Linda University Hospital where he was pronounced dead. And so here they are the day after Christmas and their 12 year old son whom he had his happiest Christmas ever according to his sister Riley. They're now preparing for his memorial. And the Martinez family is not the only family like that. Christmas, folks, frankly, really is about death. And from the earliest moments, practically, of Jesus' life, he has come for one purpose, to do what? To die. That little infant is getting ready to die on a cross. And Christmas really doesn't have its meaning without the cross standing at the end of the story. Because Jesus has come to give himself so that he could set us free from death, set us free from sin, set us free from evil, give us life. And death is really present, isn't it, very early on. Let's pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and following. Um, I decided to do this text this Sunday because it's when there's you know, less people. <laughs> you know, it's one of those texts, it'd be kind of like really easy just to, look, okay, let's kind of just read it quick and move on, right? 
we're going to hear about children, infants, two-year-old children being slaughtered. These children will be ripped from mom's arms as she's screaming and wailing and will be killed right in front of her. It's not unusual, unfortunately, because that's happening still today. As um, ISIS has spread across Saudi Arabia, um, Christian families have been brought out. But it's not just the children. It's the parents in front of the children. Denounce Jesus, you know, accept Islam, or you will die. And they'll be slaughtered there in front of their children's eyes. The little girls are taken away, put into their own form of slavery. The world is an evil place and death is a part of it. And right here at the beginning of Jesus' life, death and its horror is very real. Matthew, second chapter, verse 13. <clears throat> when they had gone, and who's they? Well, that's the... Uh, the men from the east, the wise men, the travelers who had come to Jerusalem looking for the new king that has been born, king of the Jews. Herod has found out uh, with the wise, with, excuse me, with the, the religious leaders that the prophecy is he was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So he sends them down to Bethlehem and they're supposed to then worship him and then come back up and tell Herod where the baby is so he can go there and quote, end quote, worship him as well, which means he's ready to kill him. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophets. Out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah <clears throat> weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because... They are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said to the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. There are a number of prophecies noted in this text, and I should tell you that you won't find them all in the Old Testament. You won't find a text that says that Jesus is going to be a Nazarene, will you? You can search your scriptures, and you will not find that actual prophecy. And in fact, if you look at some of the other prophecies in the one verse 18 that comes from Isaiah, a voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. What's that prophecy about? Well, actually, that was a statement of children of Israel as they were getting ready to go into bondage. The Assyrians were taking them off. I believe it was the Assyrians or the Babylonians. It was one of the two. I apologize. I don't remember. But they're taking them off into, into slavery. And as they're taking them off, it says, uh, the prophet Jeremiah says, look, they're, they're standing there and, and Rachel's weeping. Well, Rachel's dead. So why do they say she's weeping? Well, they're going by Rachel's grave. Rachel's considered the mother of Israel. 
kind of like Mary is considered the mother of Christianity in that sense. Rachel is considered mother of Israel, the wife of Jacob, Joseph, and she dies, you might remember, after Benjamin is born. She's the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. And it says that Rachel's weeping. Why? Because she's seeing the children of Israel go off into slavery. And that from the grave, she cries for her children who will be no more. So technically, it's not even a prophecy about Jesus, is it? And yet, Matthew is interesting because why is he doing this? Is he just trying to mess with scripture? Is he doing something inaccurate for us? So, that, so you know, does he just not get it? No, Matthew is a Jew. And he wants to make the point in as many ways as he possibly can that Jesus is the Messiah. So he'll take a text like the one there where he's talking about Rachel and say, but look, see, it says there's going to be weeping. And, it's, and he draws out of this Old Testament experience, this Old Testament story, something he says, look, this obviously also tells us this prophecy is also about Jesus Christ. And so he threads this understanding all throughout. So this final one, he says, you know, and he will be a Nazarene. Well, what does that mean? Well, notice, by, by the way, he says, the prophets say it. Do you remember what Isaiah said about the, the Messiah? Isaiah talks about him being broken and despised of men, rejected. That's one like a what? Like a Nazarene. And Matthew is saying, as you look through the prophets, there's a thread that's woven through there that says the Messiah is going to be one that's going to be despised, rejected. He's going to be separate. He's going to be different from the rest. That's this one from Nazareth, one that's despised, not cared for. And Matthew is trying to help his Jewish brothers and sisters to understand that this Messiah is for real and Jesus is that Messiah. <clears throat> what do you know about Herod? I've given you a little insight in the last couple of weeks, I believe it was. Um, Herod is not a nice guy, is he? <laughs> Herod... Um, in fact, you, you really did not want to be a member of Herod's family because Herod was a rather zealous person for his throne. He actually, un, unsurprisingly, lives until old age and then dies like 70-some years old when he actually dies. He doesn't lose his throne to anybody. Why? Well, basically because if they're in line for his throne, he kills them. He kills his own wife, Miriam. Um, he, at one point in time, killed 300 different officers of the court. He actually killed members of the Sanhedrin. And by doing this, he what? Puts himself totally into power. Um, people were afraid of him. In the, and I think I'd mentioned this last week. When, when Herod was about to die, he wanted to make sure that Jerusalem grieved they would be crying in the streets when he died. So he had set up for a thousand of the leaders of the city to be killed at his death. So there would be mourning and weeping and crying when he died. Herod dies kind of a nasty death. His body basically deteriorates and will not go into the details of that. But just let me tell you, it was gross. It was nasty. Herod was not a worshiper of God. In fact, technically not really even a Jew, but he had put himself up and he was considered king of the Jews because of the position he had gained by going to Rome and the, and the, and the people that he had basically killed off. <clears throat> there's a, there's a, a, a couple of different fables, you might want to say, stories around Jesus uh, traveling down to Egypt. Now, one is, is that as, as Joseph and Mary had left, they came to a cave and, and they were on their way to Egypt and they had, went into this cave and there was a spider there. Now, this is a story, it's a fable, okay? But it does have a point. Yeah. So there's a spider there and the spider wants to do something to honor the new king. And the spider decides to build a web over the front of the cave. And it's really so cold, like we had it just recently, that there's frost on everything, and frost covers the spider's web that's covering the cave. 
And the story goes that Herod's men came looking and they came up to this cave area and uh, they were going to you know, send some men to, uh, to see if anybody was in there. And they decided, oh, the captain said, no, nah, don't go in there, look. There's a spider's web over the front of it. If somebody had gone in there, they would have knocked the spider's net web down. And so the, the fable, the story is, is that the spider protected, is one, another way that God supposed protected him. Well, you know, there's all kinds of stories and things like that. The fact is, but notice what's, what God does for Jesus and really for Joseph and Mary. In a dream, he comes to Joseph and he says, Joseph, I want to protect little baby. And so you need to go to Egypt. It wasn't unusual, incidentally, for Jews to go to Egypt for when things got bad around them. In fact, there were quite a few Jews living in Egypt. So if Mary and Joseph head to Egypt, they're going to find other Jewish brothers and sisters there, people that are going to speak the Aramaic like them or, and the Hebrew, and they're going to find very, really comfortable surroundings because there were all kinds of Jews that were still living there in Egypt. And so God says, and you see what God does here? There's a really important principle for us to learn. God protects his purposes, doesn't he? He says, Joseph, go to Egypt. And he tells him to do that in a dream. Didn't he also do that already with the wise men? He says, okay, guys, don't go back to Jerusalem. How does he tell them that? He warns them in a dream. And, and God communicates some things in some amazing ways. He actually then comes again to Joseph and says, okay, it's time to go back. Oh, but when he tells him to go back, then as they get closer, then he says, oh, but don't go back to Jerusalem. Go to Nazareth. Go to another place. Go out there to Galilee. See, go, go to somewhere where you're going to still be able to protect this little boy. He's going to grow up. He's going to become ready to serve as king of kings and lord of lords. Is there an application there for us? Does God protect his purposes in your life? When he said he is Emmanuel, God with us, do you really believe it? That he's with you this very moment. That he'll be with you this week in whatever you face. Was he there for Ramon Martinez, the 12-year-old little boy? Is he there for that family as they cry and grieve and hurt? If he is God, Emmanuel, yes, he's there with them. And God is accomplishing his purposes and promises to accomplish his purposes. And look, he shows us he's going to do that in practical, specific kinds of ways. He's going to guide us through life. In fact, we're going to look at some texts and probably um, one of the key passages, obviously, is going to be Romans 8. But, but turn to Jeremiah 31, if you would, please. And, and, and if you've got your Bibles, look at verse 10 and following. <clears throat> it's part of the text that is being quoted here for, by us. And look what he says in Jeremiah 31, 10. Hear the word of the Lord. You nations, proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. What does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd takes care of his sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, the young of the flocks and herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Jesus comes to take pain. In fact, what does he say in Revelation? He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no mourning, no more crying, no more pain. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah. 
mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is what the Lord says, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy so there is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. God promises to comfort the grieving. He says to Rachel and to Israel, look, as you're going into slavery, you're going to come back because I have this bigger plan. You're going to come back and you're going to be taken care of and the crying and the weeping and the mourning will end and you'll return to the land and ultimately what is God saying to us? Folks, is death really? Is death really the worst that can happen to us? What Jesus does in coming to us and dying on the cross is he opens up heaven for us. Death is not the ultimate victor. The worst thing that could happen to us is to be judged not allowed to go to heaven. That's the worst thing. Jeremiah goes on, he says, God will refresh the weary. Are you tired? Bobby, are you tired? (laughs) You know, talk to him about the schedule he was on, trying to come here and help do Christmas Eve services and the classes he was taking and the final exams and all that kind of stuff. Is anyone else tired? Yeah. Yeah, some of us just weren't smart enough to stay in bed this morning, huh? <laughs> we just, okay, we're, we got we to gotta go to worship. Like, I know, I get up this morning, I, oh, it would really be nice day just to kind of sleep. Just just rest. What Jeremiah promises and God offers through Jesus Christ is that he gives refreshment to the weary. Let's continue in verse 18 of Jeremiah 31. I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. <laughs> Any of you moaning? Yeah, watch out if you're at the Mellinger house sometime and you're sleeping overnight because you'll probably hear Bill get out of bed and go, oh! Oh, you know, there's that moaning. The, that old back just has pain, and you, I move certain ways, and, and I, I, I try to silence myself, but sometimes I don't catch it. And it's just like, oh, and what? What, dear? No, it's, it's just my back, dear. Just, but he says, I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. So even if you're a complainer, God's listening. You disciplined me like an unruly calf, and I have been disciplined. Restore me. And I will return because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand. I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. Set up road signs. Put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road that you take. Return, virgin Israel. Return to your towns. How long will you wander, unfaithful daughter Israel? The Lord will create a new thing on earth. The woman will return to the man. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. When I bring them back from captivity, the people in the land of Judah and in its towns will once again use these words. The Lord bless you, you prosperous city, you sacred mountain. People will live together in Judah and in all its towns, farmers and those who move about with their flocks. I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Are you tired? Jesus Emmanuel who is here with you, wants to refresh you. And guess what? That refreshment may come in some way different than you expect. Rather than it coming in you just lying down and having a siesta, the greatest refreshment may come as you unwrap the gifts for somebody else. As you take Jesus to the people around you. He goes on in Jeremiah 31, verses 30 to 33. He says, God's going to make a brand new covenant with his people. Isn't that what Jesus said? 
A new covenant I make with you. And how do I form that covenant? I form that covenant with my body and my blood. I seal it by my death and my resurrection. He's, he's eating that communion meal, that last supper, the Passover meal with his disciples. and says, look, this is a new covenant. And it's bought and paid for with my blood. Jeremiah says it this way. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. You ever had sour grapes? Mm. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. God, Emmanuel, comes to be with us to what? To be our God and for us to be his people. And with that now, he makes this brand new covenant. We have this new relationship. See, now we have God where? Right alongside us. Right there with us. We don't have to go through all the kind of different formalities and stuff. We don't have to wait for the one priest to go in there once a year to go to that holy of holy places and talk to God on our behalf. We get to go straight into the presence of God. But How many of us are truly unwrapping that present? And for how many of us does it just sit there under the tree somewhere? left unused, God is with you. Is your first thought when you're going through something tough, is your very first thought, oh God? Or is it, oh God? Is, is your first thought to go to him? Is your first thought to really seek him out? Or is your first thought, now let's say I gotta figure this, I gotta do this, I have to take care of this, I have, and, and is it all about you? Because when it's all about you, guess what? The gift just got left under the tree. God is with us, and he's formed a brand new covenant. <clears throat> I forget which uh, pastor said this, so I, I'm sorry I can't give credit, but I'm just going to share some notes from, uh, and I didn't write down who it was, so sometime I'll let you know. Suffering is part of our common experience as human beings, isn't it? Anybody in pain this morning? Only one, two, only two, three, four, five. Only five of you, I'm adding mine, six. Okay, only six in pain. Well, for the rest of you, be thankful. You will be. <laughs> Because pain's common. It's, it's a part of life. And in fact, it's a valuable thing too. Suffering is part of our common experience as human beings. Look with me, if you would, at Romans, the eighth chapter. <clears throat> Romans 8, wow. Really, Romans is talking about the whole walk with God and how to have that walk with God. He says things like all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Free gift of God is eternal life. In Romans 8 now, he talks about what does it mean to really walk by the Spirit, to really have God with you at all times. Understand that you're not alone, that whatever you're facing, God's there. Look to Him for instruction, for guidance, for comfort, for encouragement. And then pick it up at verse 18 where he says, I consider that our present suffering sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul says, you know, we're hurting and people are dying just because they're, they're believers. But he says, I know that those present things, the things we're going through right now, no matter how painful they are, that look, the glory of God's going to be revealed in us and be so much better. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Even creation's crying out. Even creation, and we can't, can't we see that? When we have the smog down there in the valley, this, the creation is saying, please, please rescue us, God. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom 
of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, we're redeemed, right? If you've accepted the the blood payment uh, that Jesus Christ paid for you on the cross, you've been redeemed, yes? Yes. Ah, but there's a redemption you don't have yet, isn't it? isn't there? There is a redemption that's yet to come, and it's that redemption that comes when you get that heavenly body. And so he says, so we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, and sense the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently, are you? <laughs> Waiting patiently? <laughs> For what God is wanting to give you, you see, suffering is common. And God wants to set us free from that ultimately. Secondly, our Lord is always with us through his Holy Spirit. That's what Romans is trying to let us know. You're not walking through life without God. The Holy Spirit himself (laughs) is with you. He's come alongside of you. He's that paraclete, that helper, the one who's there to, to be next to you and to encourage you and challenge you and to exhort you. In fact, Take a look at Psalm 73, verses 21 to 28. Psalm 73, 21. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. When I was in trouble, I was a mess, kind of what he's saying. Yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Is that true of you? Is that psalm true of you? Christians, number three, are assured that any suffering that comes their way has come from the hand of their loving God for their good and for his glory. Let's go back to Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. You know one of the things that helps you become more like Jesus? It's pain, difficulties, challenges, stress of life. We actually have a choice to make at that moment, don't we? We can take the wide road or we can take the narrow road. We can become like the world or we can become like Jesus. He predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also what? Glorified. There's good news, isn't there? I can't help but remembering what Solzhenitsyn said that when he came to America. Solzhenitsyn, he wrote the Gulag Archipelago. He was imprisoned for his faith in Jesus Christ in the prisons of Russia. Oh, nasty places where he lived and almost died. And he came out of there and and he came to America and he says, I find that it is harder to live as a Christian in America than it was in the Gulag. Sometimes we are so thankful that we're not suffering that we miss the fact that our wealth, our prosperity, all that we have, the great things that we enjoy, the freedoms that, that are ours may actually be a hindrance to our relationship with God. 
they may be worse than the suffering that our brothers and sisters are going through who are under severe persecution and even death. Because we give in to them or we get distracted or we give our attention to other things or we become complacent, we become lukewarm as Laodicea did and we stop living with passion for Christ. And so Nitzan said, it was harder to live for Jesus in this country. Oh my. Lastly, from this other pastor, he said, we can triumphantly face our sufferings in the light of the fact that Christ, our Savior, suffered infinitely for us that we might have eternal life. And so then continue in Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this, in response to all the trials and the difficulties and the pain and the challenges you're facing? What shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? What's the greatest gift? Christ. And God gave that greatest gift to each one of us. Are you opening it? And as you open up that gift, remember that the birth, the manger, all these things that have been so cute and sweet and all, right? Have all been about preparing for that gift to die. That baby, Jesus Christ, saw the cross from the moment he was placed in Mary's womb from the beginning of time, even before he was there. And as he grows and all, he's moving to one place with one purpose, to die, to set us free. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? The only one who has a right to, Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, so whether I live or I die, neither angels nor demons, so the spiritual forces out there of wickedness and of good, nor any powers, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers. So that means not even any kind of government, any IRS regulation, no one, nothing, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Christmas is about death. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Mary the sword will pierce your own heart. You see, folks, we need the baby to die, don't we? Jeremiah said it this way, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. I just one last quote for you. This one I, is from a gentleman, a pastor named Steve Zeisler. He's uh, up at um, church in, uh, in the Bay Area. He says, the facts of death and our accountability 
for the way we live are here at the beginning of the Christmas story. It's the story of one who came to do battle with the forces of death. This little baby would fight for us and would absorb for us what we deserved. The, be the battle began almost the first moment of his life. And it's a battle that he would win for us. He would break the power of tyrants, born that men no more may die, the carol says. What a great promise of the birth of Christ. We will miss what is deepest about this season if we don't look from the manger to the cross and from the cross to the empty tomb and the shout of victory. Jesus came because he was going to the cross. As we leave Christmas, may Jesus lead us to the cross. And when we're standing there at the cross, folks, the worst thing you can do is be selfish with your presence. Because the world needs Jesus. Father God, thank you for the sacrifice we don't understand. And, and just, oh my God, the pain that those mothers felt when those little babies were ripped from their arms and slaughtered, just it's tragic and horrible. The pain of the Martinez family as they've, for one moment, are celebrating the fun and the best Christmas ever that their son is experiencing. The next moment, they're grieving his death. And there are so many other stories that we don't even know of, God, but they're right around us. I, I think of Russ, his friend, who, who just died this week in the memorial yesterday. I think of Leslie's friend and the, the, the fear he has as his brain is bleeding. Lord, there, there's others, Lord. There's people going through so much trauma and tragedy and difficulty and pain. And we can't totally understand and oftentimes we feel um, so weak. But Lord, remind us as we keep our eyes on the cross that you are offering something that will give hope and life and even peace to those who desperately need it. Oh, Jesus, please, as you give us peace, show us the divine appointments. Help us to lead others to your cross. In Jesus' name, amen.